Hi, hello, hello everyone. Yes, I want to still take it a break. Some people are coming back, very good. So we are ready to begin with the next uh, panel discussion. We have three wonderful speakers and uh, my name is Elena Gaida. I'm, um, I'm, um, I'm uh, a friend, <laughs> a friend of LGBT community. And uh, uh, yeah, so, um, in the, yeah, we, uh, the name of the, uh, the name of the panel is How to Use History and Research and Advocacy, Work and Struggle for Equality. And as uh, was mentioned before, I think a couple of times, and I will definitely repeat myself, I, always re I also will repeat that, I'm sorry for my lack of, uh, of knowledge, but, um, and also repeat that um, Latvia is not actually, is not really far in, uh, in terms of equality, or is it, is it gender equality or um, equality that go, goes in terms of LGBT community. And uh, I wanted to say baby steps, but uh, then I understood that it's actually maybe not even that far. Because I think um, there are a few people, and we also like, whenever we come across a person that we have to kind of explain what it's all about, that we always kind of use those same arguments. And my knowledge about history in, uh, in, in this is very little. And so I think it's great that we have these people who are going to try to help us to get new arguments and, 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 and new knowledge, how to, how to maybe, um, I don't know, in a conversation or like in our work or everywhere we go, how to get, um, I don't know, inform people better or educate as well. So I'm really ready for uh, these people to educate me and probably some people as well here. So we have uh, Vera uh, Chern uh, Chernigina, uh, LGBT activist from Ukraine. Uh, we have Arturas Rodomanskis, uh, Tolerant Youth Association Lithuania. And Cynthia Nogueira. Yes, it's all, yeah. LGBT activist from Portugal, Portugal slash Lithuania. Uh, yeah, it's a very nice location. So, okay, so I think uh, we're gonna, uh, Vida's gonna begin first. Are you sure? Sure, oh, yeah, if you feel okay. You can use this. I will use Russia, sorry for my Russian language, but uh, I can uh, speak in Ukrainian, but uh, uh, I, Я боюсь, что люди, которые сидят в этих будках, не поймут меня. Я Вера, я занимаюсь ЛГБТ-активизмом в Украине более 10 лет, и в основном это активизм лесбийский, но в последние годы я работаю и с ЛГБТ-сообществом напрямую, и на Киев, в Киев Прайде в этом движении. И для меня очень важно сейчас представлять и Киев Прайд, и ЛГБТ, скажем так, движение из Украины. По поводу исторических каких-то уже фактов, которые мы можем применять для развития ЛГБТ движения в Украине, тут сложно сказать, потому что задокументированных каких-то вещей в книгах или в каких-то сборниках, их, их на самом деле мало. А, а все почему? Мы имели такое, ну, как вы знаете, постсоветские страны имели опыт тоталитарного режима эти много-много лет, которые на, выхлопе, на, на выходе у нас была такая ситуация, что а, трансгендеров у нас не было, а, травис, э, э, трансвеститы, они были демонизированы или патологизированы, а лесбиянок лечили, геев сажали. Это основная идея, которая а, пришла к нам даже с тем, что а, Украина была первой страной, которая отменила а, уголовное преследование за а, статью за мужеложество 121. Тем не менее, та, скажем так, субкультура, которая формировалась во время советского периода, она не, не была готова к тому, чтобы действовать, и не, не была готова к тому, чтобы выйти и говорить, да, мы геи, лесбиянки, вот они мы, и мы гордимся этим. Поэтому вот этот период, он как бы скажем так, немножко застопорил то движение, которое могло было бы быть. А что было дальше? 
это были, скажем так, ВИЧ-сервисные организации, которые работали для противодействия ВИЧ. И, 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 возможно, тут есть один нюанс и отличие с моим коллегой из России, это то, что у нас были ВИЧовские деньги, грубо говоря, а у России были деньги правозащитных организаций. То есть это повлияло на то, что мы не сразу стали говорить о правах человека. Я тороплюсь. Мы стали говорить о том, что вот у нас есть проблема с ВИЧ, люди стали ассоциировать геев с этой эпидемией, и то есть нам еще в последующем приходится выходить из этого, скажем так, стереотипа, что все геи больны на ВИЧ. И тут же я хотела бы отметить, для лесбийского движения в Украине тоже была проблема, что зашли ВИЧ-деньги, ну то есть, грубо говоря, не зашли, их нужно было, вы все понимаете, там, освоить, написать заявку, и реализовать проект. То есть это огромная работа, но возможность взять какое-то финансирование для развития ЛГБТ было вот только вот это направление. Что очень плохо повлияло на лесбийское движение в том смысле, что... Ну, как, в принципе, женщины не имели секса во время тоталитарного режима или до этого, то при... и женщины не могли, собственно, заразиться ВИЧ. Поэтому как-то мы как выкарабкивались из того, что было, и использовали те ресурсы, которые есть, и поэтому видимость лесбийского сообщества она была незначительной. Я не могу сказать, что какие-то еще исторические факты в Украине влияли на развитие ЛГБТ дальше. Могу сказать, что у нас был прекрасный опыт европейских стран и американских стран, и нам ничего не оставалось делать, как пытаться перенимать их, их уже наработанную схему и интегрировать ее в свои реалии. Но... Это было не очень заметно, и видимость ЛГБТ была слабенькой. До двух моментов важных в Украине, которые произошли, это революции, это оранжевая революция и революция достоинства, которая была у нас в 2014 году. Вот эти два исторических момента очень сильно, скажем так, пнули, если это можно перевести, ЛГБТ-сообщество, и не, не просто сам, самим фактом, что произошло изменение какого-то режима, а то, что на волне этих э, революций э, появились, много появилось осознанных гражданских людей, людей, которые занимались гражданской позицией, э, всякими движениями. И вот они, начиная свою работу, там, я не знаю, вплоть до э, того, как в подъезде должен был, э, должно все выглядеть, э, заканчивая э, верхушкой власти, они дали нам понять, что пора бороться. Ну, что э, вот люди вокруг борются, а мы э, ну, типа не боремся. Вот. И как бы это было э, мотивацией для нас тоже. Это с одной стороны. С другой стороны, эти революции а, дали такой, ну как бы, и национализировали ЛГБТ тоже. То есть мы поняли, что мы находимся в Украине, что Украина — это та страна, в которой нужно развивать ЛГБТ, и что мы гордимся тем, что мы люди, а, мы украинцы, которые а, и ЛГБТ тоже, и а, там, как бы, болеем за права человека. Но с другой стороны у нас появляется такая полярная, другая сторона медали всего этого. Это национализировались и праворадикальные группы, которые стали очень большой проблемой для развития ЛГБТ, для видимости ЛГБТ в обществе. Потому что выходя из шкафа, выходим не только мы, а выходят еще праворадикально настроенные группы, которые готовы давать серьезный отпор. Это про две таких постсоветскую действительность и постреволюционную. Что еще я хотела сказать? Вот какова тенденция на сейчас? 
Мы имеем, как вы знаете, у нас в прошлом году, в этом году и в позапрошлом были довольно успешные марши, которые собирали, вот последний марш был, собрал 3000 человек. И для нас это успех, и следующий марш мы планируем провести в рамках 5000. Это, исходя из истории прайдов, это где-то около 10-15% из всей массы прайд-движения в мире. То есть мы за 4 года марши мы сделали большой прыжок в развитии в развитии этого движения и видимости ЛГБТ. Но эта штука была возможна благодаря той же самой, скажем так, той же самой революции, которая обязала а, полицию, а, как бы стимулировала, я не знаю, какими стимулами, а, но а, все-таки обеспечивать права человека и обеспечивать право на мирное собрание. То есть мы имеем возможность сотрудничать с полицией, в отличие, допустим, от Западной Америки, там, в которой, наоборот, полиция была тем, той противодействующей силой, то у нас полиция как бы стоит рядом с нами. И это большой плюс. А также благодаря опыту Киев Прайда теперь все публичные мероприятия стараются проводить по такому же принципу работы с полицией и работы с общественностью. И это имеет результаты, если в моем городе 17 мая, в день противодействия гомофобии, мы получили такой опасный сигнал, и наша акция была кроваво разогнана, то уже через полгода и город, и ЛГБТ, и люди, которые видят, что это несправедливо, они подготовились к другой акции, которая прошла по всем правилам Киев Прайда. И у нас была успешная, безопасная акция на 11 числа День камин -аута. Вот. Еще один важный момент, то, что СМИ э, начали тоже, скажем так, быть людьми, может быть, э, и стали э, адекватно освещать э, э, ЛГБТ э, в, э, ну, в разных сюжетах, не приписывая там слово «гомосексуалист», если вы знаете, в, в чем отличие, а уже правильно используя термины. Это тоже как бы э, тот, же, тот же ком, который пошел от того, что появилась э, активная гражданская позиция, ЛГБТ начала двигаться, э, полиция стала сотрудничать, СМИ стала реагировать на то, что ну, лучше сказать э, хорошо, чем, ну, лучше сказать правду, чем опять нагнетать вот этот вот э, геи вышли в розовых шортах или в кожаных трусах. Вот. А что касается исторических каких-то, скажем так, документов, то у нас на сегодняшний момент есть книга ЛГБТ-движение в Украине. Она вышла совсем недавно, в 2014, по-моему, году. А также у нас есть, я этим горжусь, что в моем городе есть такой гендерный музей, единственный в Украине и первый в Украине, который, который имеет в себе очень много экспонатов, в том числе и с, ну, не только женской истории, а еще о правах человека, о правах женщин и правах лесбиянок. Вот. И также у нас есть еще такая книжка «Быть лесбенкой в Украине» очень странная, но она говорит о том, как жили лесбиянки в период 2008-2010, когда вот это был застой и не было вот этих вот жестких волнений, то есть описывали жизнь лесбийскую. Вот. И я чем-то хотела закончить, но думаю, что у нас хорошие... А, вот, я хотела сказать еще, что Украина, благодаря вот этим фактам этих двух революций, она выбивается из, то есть становится уникальной, и с уникальным опытом ЛГБТ-движения от других постсоветских стран, потому что мы использовали этот опыт революции, мы использовали ну, эту, эту, скажем так, возможность, и я думаю, что... Мне бы хотелось, чтобы Украина была ну, тоже не одна из последних стран, а одна из первых стран, в которых мы таки будем гордиться своей идентичностью и выходить на марши, 
и наконец-то праздновать, а не бороться. Вот, спасибо. It's supposed that I should start. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. Okay, uh, fine. Um, <clears throat> so, um, well, before I, I, I was getting ready for, for this uh, panel discussion, actually I looked at the history, which is actually, uh, I would, um, would like to admit that it's very important for the community um, to, to look back what is achieved, uh, uh, where we are now, and how to get uh, uh, further, and um, but uh, but I uh, but I also looked a little bit more uh, um, um, back to Lithuanian's history, and um, um, I found some interesting facts that uh, um, as a homosexual was accused uh, some rulers of uh, um, uh, republic of both nations, for example. Um, so there was a king of Poland uh, and the Grand Duke of Lithuania, Mikolas Kaributas uh, Vetskis. Uh, it was in the uh, 17th century, which actually was uh, accused always that he is uh, uh, surrounded by many guys uh, and uh, he liked uh, uh, makeup and uh, was uh, cross-dressing quite all, uh, often. Um, uh, same was accused the ruler of the uh, Republic of both nations, Vladislava uh, Svaza, which is, was also in the 17th century. Um, as, uh, also, um, one the person in her historical novels, uh, French King Henry Valois, who was a very shortly one year, actually just one year in the 16th century, the ruler of, uh, uh, of the Republic of both nations. And uh, also the Stan Stanislavas Augustas Poniatowskis, um, um, because he w uh, there was kind of like uh, rumors that he has a kind of like uh, relationships with uh, ambassador of England, and there were many other rumors as well. And uh, then when we were coming back actually to uh, uh, the 20th century, I would like to, uh, to mention that actually it was very, um, Lithuanian history was very connected with, uh, uh, with what was going around uh, because the country was many times uh, um, um, ruled by uh, different uh, leaders and from different nations. Um, and uh, well, so um, in 1917, uh, the October uh, Revolution in Russia repeals the previous criminal code actually and in in its entirely including Article 1990, uh, 995. And uh, um, I found the fact that leaders from that time boost that homosexual relationships and heterosexual relationships are treated the same by the law. So that means that uh, um, a little bit later in 1922, a new criminal code were uh, introduced in the uh, 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 Soviet Union and uh, which decriminalized homosexual acts. But uh, then uh, again was criminalized by Stalin in 1933. So, um, and since that time until uh, independence of Lithuania in uh, 1991, um, um, it was uh, criminalized and actually even if we became uh, independent in 1991, it was not, uh, um, that article was not uh, um, uh, replaced, and it was replaced actually only and uh, decriminalized only in 1993 when Lithuania joined the uh, Council of uh, Europe um, and uh, um, ratified the convention. So, and at that time, there was actually uh, 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 there is the last 70, about 70 persons from the prison because they were jailed because of uh, um, they were accused as a homosexuals. But uh, um, so I picked those facts. I found the, the, uh, those facts actually in some uh, books and in the internet. But um, if we would look to um, 
the clear and like uh, very structured uh, history of uh, LGBT community. I, I couldn't find any books or or articles which uh, um, um, would actually somehow relate to that and uh, analyze this uh, fact. So it's very hard actually to um, um, to understand everything if uh, when you are not a historian. And I am not a historian. I am a, a LGBT activist, uh, a lawyer, and biologist. So it's a little bit a different perspective for me. But at the same time, it's very important actually to know uh, th these facts because um, later you are also constructing uh, um, your activities, uh, because uh, the history a little bit, uh, some um, maybe not a little bit, but it's also uh, gives some backgrounds uh, uh, what you can achieve. And uh, well, so what I uh, personally recognize that uh, after independence in 1991 in Lithuania, there was a kind of like. Uh, two ways, uh, which was one of, uh, of the ways were a little bit more secular way, uh, which tried uh, um, to unite people uh, by uh, trying to uh, tie up more uh, with European Union, with uh, Council of Europe, and with international uh, institutions, which could uh, somehow um, to. Um, show that Lithuania is kind of like independent country, uh, and um, and uh, that in, and it was kind of like opposition as well to the form uh, um, previous uh, Soviet Union where we were uh, for uh, um, half of the century. And the second actually um, 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 very tied up with uh, uh, with the church. Um, and with the Catholic Church especially, because in Lithuania, Catholic Church is very powerful. Um, more than 80 persons say uh, um, that uh, um, of Lithuanian uh, uh, society says that they are Catholics. And uh, um, that way, actually, when because the church was one of the, those opposing to the Soviet period uh, structures, um, and so it was like, uh, it was like because of opposing, but at the same time, um, uh, they choose a very um, um, uh, strange narrative to um, uh, to uh, to actually to boost the uh, um, uh, the ideas which they want to actually um, to show. And um, um, actually, I found a very interesting uh, comment uh, made by Anglican Church uh, Canterbury Archbishop advisor, uh, Alan Murray, which say, uh, said that, um, um, and it's very fit to Lithuanian context, that uh, um, traditional values, actually, uh, he said, that is used in an opposite way as it should be. Um, because it's supposed to be like love, empathy, compassion, hope, pity, but now traditional values tied up with the traditional families, which is um, a very political actually and not na uh, and artificial uh, completely actually. And it's actually that a narrative is used uh, um, to um, oppose to you uh, actually to um, what actually European Union uh, um, propose uh, um, uh, human rights uh, 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 freedom uh, and and um, and uh, against those values actually and um, um, and when you know when you have such a like uh, just a uh, small details for, from the history, you don't have a very when you don't have a very clear uh, um, um, perspective for, and uh, understandings of of that. You, it's very hard actually to um, to find who is the player now um, in uh, nowadays in the, in the independent uh, Lithuania. And uh, therefore, um, um, well, I, I would like to actually somehow to contribute to Urata's, uh, uh, what Urata mentioned before, that uh, now it looks like that uh, um, struggles for LGBT rights, it's like brought something from the West, uh, um, like a neoliberal, uh, neoliberal uh, uh, concept. But it's not like a worldwide struggle for, for the rights, for, for for um, for human rights, and uh, and 
and now when we look actually um, what we are like uh, doing in, in Lithuania when we are fighting for LGBT uh, 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 rights in our communities and when we are going uh, to talk with, uh, um, with um, um, young people for example uh, we are actually we are talking about Stonewall, we are talking about uh, Harvey Milk um, and we are explaining that, that was a huge struggle and it continued along and it's still uh, like con uh, we have a very tight relations especially with Harvey Milk because uh, uh, Harvey Milk uh, um, um, grandparents uh, moved from Lithuania so we try to to shift that uh, connections uh, to show that those connections that people could a little bit find kind of empathy to to those uh, uh, things what Harvey Milk achieved actually um, uh, during his life uh, and uh, what uh, other uh, um, uh, political players and uh, and uh, community members uh, they uh, developed actually. Um, but those actually, those, but those stories from abroad, um, I would say that um, nowadays. Uh, for the uh, for the uh, youth generations, uh, they are not understand that, uh, as a kind of like a struggle, and um, um, and and they could it and it's very hard actually them uh, to get uh, um, uh, to get from their uh, kind of uh, um, solidarity uh, in, in in a new struggle because it's a long term process and it's uh, like always continuing. And uh, and therefore it's uh, um, because they cannot find those uh, details, so it's uh, it's very hard to explain sometimes that, for example, when we are trying to uh, get in European Union in 2004, uh, people were uh, some people who were working at the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, they prepared many documents um, trying to implement all the progressive things in our uh, uh, law because when we uh, join the European Union we have to shift many, uh, uh, change uh, uh, many uh, laws in, in, uh, in Lithuania. And, and actually those people, uh, young people, they actually did not understand that it was a, also a struggle that was it was very hard because when uh, some uh, politicians were recognized that somebody is doing such things actually they are trying all the progressive uh, put uh, pro progressive side put in uh, our laws they said who is actually working on the, that side and uh, i remember there was a, one of the member of parliament grajulis that who is those uh, uh, um, who is supporting those faggots actually from uh, from the ministry that the, that uh, that uh, putting in uh, under the law such things, and um, well, so I think that um, 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 going to the end, actually, I, I think that if we could somehow um, 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 make um, or or all those Baltic states or the Eastern European side. Uh, we somehow to tie up all uh, what we ex uh, experience here, and if we if, we, if it would be possible to have a um, um, like a region story or even uh, country by country's uh, history uh, um, on LGBT rights, it would help somehow a little bit to get more solidarity from the uh, community because they could understand that it's a long-term struggle and it's not just appeared and um, was uh, brought from uh, from uh, somewhere from a western country or or, or, or or somehow and well and because i don't want to actually to repeat what urata said but but um, urata also mentioned many things that there was a at places where people gathering, there was a newspapers uh, where, where people went, were, were printed, and it was a long-term thing, which is actually uh, have to be understood uh, by uh, uh, community and by the society as well. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, yes, next speaker, Cynthia. You're going to have a presentation as well, so we can. 
So, uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I would like to start uh, thanking you, uh, Mosaica, for this invitation. It's a pleasure for me to learn from all of your experiences and knowledge, so it's a very good uh, opportunity for me today. Um, so, what, um, when I was talk, uh, told about this, this panel, I thought about um, talking a little bit about the Portuguese history, LGBT history, and try to link it to uh, some advocacy work and how uh, organizations, LGBT organizations, tried to develop and um, how movements um, were motivated by some events on history. So uh, I'm not going to talk about all the LGBT history today, but I chose some events and some uh, people that changed the course of LGBT um, work in Portugal, actually. So by the 19th century, uh, Homosexuality was not included in the law, but um, it was punish uh, punishable uh, under law against uh, act of indecent uh, assault. So it was agglomerated um, with all of what was considered then uh, deviant behaviors. So. Homeless people, homosexual, uh, prostitutes, all of them were considered the same, and um, so they were punished by being uh, what they were. And only by 1912, um, the first law was published where homosexual is addressed as one who indulges in the practice of vices against nature. So it was punishable by imprisonment up to six months. Um, so maybe you don't know a lot about um, Portuguese history, but we had a dictatorship as well, and it started by 1933. So it was a fascist um, dictatorship, so a little bit different from um, the East. Um, so during the, the, all of those years of uh, dictatorship, it was f the 43, 42 years, uh, LGBT people uh, were persecuted and they were usually sent to psychiatric hospitals, they were beaten, humiliated, etc. But we didn't used to talk about them during this time. Uh, as um, in here, what happened, if we don't talk about them, they don't exist. So um, that was what we lived during this, those 42 years. Uh, so let's not just talk about uh, LGBT people and let's just not have history. Um, so by 1954, uh, there was this uh, revision of penal call code, uh, and they adopt new security measures um, for individual who usually indulges in the practice of vices against nature. So penalt penalties here were diverse, but it, they could lead to prohibition of the exercise of a, uh, a job, a profession. Um, so, and they could go from one month to 10 years of jail, actually. So during all of those years of dictatorship, we see that there were no uh, movements, uh, no organizations for LGBT, and no advocacy work because it was impossible. Um, by 74, so the end of the, the end of the dictatorship, we uh, people actually LGBT tried to um, have more uh, influence in public's view, but it was very, very difficult, and uh, results were very far from what was expected. So only uh, by uh, 80s, when we tried to get in European Union, um, 
we started hearing a little bit about LGBT, actually. So, and uh, there was this event, so in 80, uh, the death of a famous ballet dancer. So this ballet dancer was sent to a psychiatric hospital by 1938 actually, because he used to dress like a woman for his shows, and uh, he was considered like um, a not normal person because he had gender identity problems, uh, they, they thought, and uh, here um, he, he was sent there and he actually stayed there, so until 1980 where he died, and in, in this hospital he had psych, uh, psychiatric uh, treatment and all of those treatments that they used to do to uh, LGBT people, um, like electric shocks, etc., etc., and um, this was a proof that science um, was with the, um, this ideologic um, idea of um, of the the um, dictatorship. Uh, that LGBT people weren't uh, normal and they should stay in psych uh, psychiatric hospitals. So this uh, event actually um, mo uh, motivated LGBT organizations and LGBT people start going to the streets and start talking about it. And by 1982, there was a revision of the penal code and homosexuality um, uh, they um, ended the, dis the discriminalized homosexuality so um, but this law wasn't that perfect back, uh, back then because they were still um, considered that it was in the sentence assault when it was practiced between adult and a minor. So there was this difference between the age of consent for uh, heterosexual and homosexual. If you were uh, homosexual, the consent age was 16 years old, and if you were uh, heterosexual, actually it was 14 years old. And this law uh, only was changed back uh, 2007. So, as I told, um, some uh, this movement, this LGBT movement, didn't really. Uh, it was really felt on the street until some years after the end of, of the dictatorship, and the 90s actually um, changed uh, this panorama. So, um, by the 90s, more consistent voices begin to emerge in the Portuguese gay and lesbian advocacy work. Um, and why does it happen? It happens uh, as in Ukraine, I believe, because of the HIV, um, the AIDS. So the emergency of uh, this um, uh, illness uh, made that some people gathered in order to uh, fight against um, this illness. So after that, after trying to fight against, uh, against it, LGBT organizations were actually created officially because there was this um, need to combat uh, this idea that uh, HIV is directly linked to uh, LGBT people. So we wanted to stop having this direct uh, link and that's why uh, those organizations were created, they were motivated by, um, by this event. So by um, 2004, uh, sexual orientation uh, as non-discrimination factor is included in the Constitution. So only by 2004. Uh, with all of the the progress and the work of LGBT organizations. But by 2006, and this is an event that I actually remember and that motivated my advocacy work as well. Uh, so Gisberta, 
uh, was a Brazilian Im immigrant, transgender, HIV positive, drug addict, prostitute and homeless. And she was murdered by 14 young boys and they were uh, between 10 and 16 years old. So um, Gisberta, she used to do some shows in Porto uh, but the money wouldn't pay a house, so she was homeless back then. And there was uh, those three boys that once found her in an abandoned building. And they started uh, talking to her and asking her questions. And they uh, were actually very, they empathized with her and the fact that she had, she lived with all of those problems. And they started cooking for her and taking care of her a little bit until they decided to talk in school about um, about this person, about the situation and the fact that she was living in this abandoned building. And what happened is that those three boys that used, used to take care of uh, Gisberta um, plus uh, 11 other uh, started going there to make fun of her and make f not only making fun of her but actually um, beating her and torturing her and uh, sh they were uh, a lot and she was um, suffering from HIV disease uh, and back then she was poor she couldn't do much and this uh, situation um, uh, went for like three or four days. They used just go after school. They would go there and they would beat her and they would do torture her, etc., etc., until they um, they kill her actually. And by the end, she was dead and she was found alone because one of the boys couldn't stand it anymore and he would uh, talk to his uh, teacher at school. Uh, telling all the story. So, the day after she was found dead, uh, media uh, talked a little bit about this situation, uh, but not showing pictures of this person, uh, calling her by her man's name, um, um, saying that her was she was transgender saying that uh, she was HIV positive so um, this uh, media uh, situation actually uh, was um, a motive for LGBT people to start going to the street and talk about it and to denounce how uh, people uh, see those kind of uh, crimes because the crimes were not that um, were not that big because she was a trans transgender crime was not that big because she was homeless crime was not that big because she was immigrant etc etc so uh, this actually changed a little bit uh, big actually uh, the um, LGBT advocacy work in Portugal and this person became an icon for LGBT people and every year uh, since this um, event uh, Gisberta is um, is uh, talked about in the um, pride parade so I think this uh, this is a, a the most important historical event for us. Um, by 2010, uh, there was the law allowing civil marriage between individuals uh, of the same sex. And by 2015, the parliament approves adoption of children by same-sex couples. So I do believe that history counts because uh, in Portugal, uh, there was a uh, big difference between how uh, advocacy work used to be uh, during the dictatorship and how advocacy work you are uh, is right now. So those uh, events, those situations that make our history um, made that people like me, activists, but um, people started to fight uh, against stereotypes, 
people start to fight and struggle for uh, equality. And um, okay, I think I'm, I told everything about the Portuguese situation. Actually, uh, I'm not going to talk about the Lithuanian because we already heard, but I wanted to uh, just say a small um, extra. Last week, actually, we had the presence of Tony Fenwick uh, of Schools Out and uh, Bill Schiller from Tulipak from UK. And they came to Lithuania um, talking about uh, LGBT month history. That is something that is happening for a decade in UK and that they are trying to implement in Baltic states. Uh, and it's actually very interesting that one week after I'm here and we are talking about history. And we actually gathered in Lithuania in LGL organization and they, what we uh, discussed and the conclusions w that we arrived is that there is this lack of history that um, needs to be filled because the fact that there is there is no history that no one is actually trying to um, to research about it. It makes that people don't have um, identity by the past and. Um, this person, Bill Schiller from UK, um, he was actually talking that for one month in UK, since one decade, they are only talking about history LGBT. And they are doing a lot of researches, and I think it would be a very good idea to implement um, in here, maybe try to, to do it in Lithuania, find someone that could actually do it. Thank you very much. Yes, unfortunately, we have ran out of time, so I guess we don't have uh, any time for the questions. But I think we can give a great round of applause again for the, uh, the panelists. And I hope you're going to continue with your great work. Thank you. I definitely learned a lot, and I think uh, other people as well. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And